Hallelujah, saints of God. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give God some glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good, saints. Amen. Um, I was told we, uh, among uh, the visitors on live stream and all the new visitors here, amen, we, we have a special guest this morning, a uh, uh, gospel recording artist, uh, Kathy Burrell is with us this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on in. Come on and wave to Philadelphia. Hallelujah. We love you, sister. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Bless, bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm coming. Hallelujah, woman of God. Hallelujah. What's going on? Whoa, that's a tall man right there. Huh? Watch out now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's from the Burrell family. Amen. Uh, her sister is also a recording artist. They must have did something good in that family, amen. Sister is Kim Burrell, and we're just so pleased to, to have y'all here. And Minister Phil was telling me that we're going to be able to help each other out coming up soon with an event that's going to be at Philadelphia, amen. Hallelujah. It's going to be a blessing from what I can hear. I know y'all still working out details, so I don't want to say too much, amen. But people, y'all going to be able to come, amen. And if you got gifts and talents, they're going to be blessing people with wisdom and scholarships, amen, and, and we're going to turn the music gift, gift loose in Philadelphia, amen, because we need it, we need it. There was a time, amen, we didn't even have music, amen, I just get up and preach, amen, and, and now we're seeing a, a shaking happening, a moving happening, amen, and, and so we, we know that that's the reason God has brought you to this city, amen, uh, uh, to deposit something, amen, hallelujah, as far as uh, worship and and gospel and the gift is concerned. All right, saints, listen, let's go to Acts chapter 7, and we're going to get cranked up. And um, I just want to warn you, okay? Um, hmm, man. All right. I don't know how to say it. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be tough in here, all right? All right, it's going to be tough, all right? It's going to be convicting, but not condemning, all right? I, I'm not, I came to condemn. But I will be talking about some things that you've done, amen, that you didn't do right, amen. But I don't want you to be condemned about it, amen. And I'm going to talk about it, amen, not to condemn you, but to stop folk that hadn't done what you did just yet, amen. I'm going to give the message that you wish you would have got before you made the mistake, all right. So just work with me on that, amen. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to talk about some things that you currently going through. And, and even some things that I, I know some of y'all going through, but it's a temptation, amen, for me as a pastor not to preach it. Because it's like, oh, they think I'm going to be thinking I'm going to talk about this. I ain't talking about you. But I'm doing that because somebody is right on the, the cusp of about to do what you doing, and I might be able to stop them. Amen. I'm talking about it was going down after service, all right? And so, so, so just beware, all right? Let me see what else. Um, you know, j just remember, y'all, it's all good. All right? Somebody say it's all good. It's all in love. All right? Um, now, the devil didn't want y'all to get this word. He didn't want y'all to get it at all. All right? Um, you know, I'm in the word last night late, you know, and I hear water. I said, Lord, breakthrough done happened. No, a pipe bust in my attic. Anybody hear me up in here? So it's like 3 o'clock. I'm in the attic, you know. And uh, I didn't, I, no, I didn't sleep, you know, but it's good. It's good. He wanted me to stay up all night, all right? I was able to stay up all night, meditate and stuff like that, all right? So the devil didn't want y'all to get this here, all right? But, but, but I'm, I'm hoping that, that I can... I can deliver it like God gave it. I, Father, remember, I'm nothing but dust. But, but if you feel me, if you touch me, if you speak through me, Daddy, then we can change a generation. So fill us up, Daddy, in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 1. The Bible says, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren, fathers, hearken, the God of glory, appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon, And he said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into a land which I will show thee. 
Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. In verse 5 is where we want to focus. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. And saints, you know where we are in the book of Acts. We've just been going line by line from chapter 1, verse 1. We're in chapter 7 now, and uh, Stephen is on the stand, and he begins to talk about Abraham. So we've been going back and talking about Abraham, how, he, how God appeared unto him. And secondly, how God told him, get thee out, come out your country, come out your kindred. And they, we, we challenge each other, come out the world. Come out of the, of the negative family and friends that's, that's influencing you the wrong way. Come out. Get thee out. And then we looked at this third point, and we're still on it, none inheritance. And we saw that Abraham only received the promise for the land, the, the title deed. But he never really possessed the land. He didn't own, hallelujah, not even a, a square foot of the land. The only thing he owned was the grave that he bought for Sarah. But God didn't give that time he bought that. You see, it was, it, he, he received none inheritance from the Lord. And that's what the Bible is saying here. But Abraham did everything he did for the Lord and was faithful and left his land, amen, not because of him. He did it, amen, because he knew his obedience would bless his children after him, all right? So for Abraham, it was all about something we call legacy. He received no inheritance. He didn't receive possession of it, but his children did. The children of Israel, the Hebrews, anybody know what I'm talking about, all right? So none inheritance. So y'all, we began to talk about it a little bit. And we said that we got to leave our children some things. And like Abraham, we got to leave a legacy of wealth. And so we talked about, amen, hallelujah, the fact that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children. But not just his children. Who? His children's children. And we need to strive for that as a people and as a church. Then we talked about the most important legacy. We said that we need to leave what? A legacy of faith. Anybody hear me up in here? where we leave a legacy of salvation, sanctification, churchmanship with attendance and, and membership and tithing, amen, and, and service, amen. We, need, we leave a legacy of personal Bible study, of personal prayer. Our children should see us, amen, and see our faith lived out, amen, and it's going to help them to live it out in the next generation. Come on, give God some glory, amen. A legacy of wealth, a legacy of faith. But wealth and faith are not the only legacies that we have to leave for our children, all right? We must leave a legacy of marriage, a legacy of marriage. And we just, we just going through, and, and I already gave you the, 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 the road map of where I'm going at with legacy, amen? So this Sunday is just the legacy of marriage, all right? And we need to leave that far with kids. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Amen. Abraham was concerned with legacy, and we must be concerned with legacy as well. Now, saints, listen. There are six things that I'd like to speak about in regards to marriage. Amen. Six things in regards to legacy of marriage. And if we get through them all, fine. But at a certain time, I'm going to stop. Amen. And, and we'll just pick up again next time. All right. Six things. All right. Pastor. What's important for me to leave a legacy of marriage for my children? Huh? What can I show them through my marriage? What can I show them through my walk? That's vital for them to pick up and live out. Huh? It's going to be challenging, y'all. Y'all ready for that? Yeah. All right. Come on. Somebody say, give us the truth. Give us the truth. All right. The first thing we're going to need to give them is a legacy of marital commitment. A legacy of marital commitment. And I'm going to show you what that is in a second, amen, and that's just the title I put upon it, amen. But marital commitment right here, I'm referring to a willingness, hallelujah, of an individual to make a commitment to get married, all right? To make a commitment to get married. 
When you leave a legacy of marriage to your children, amen, you should be a big enough man, a big enough woman to where they see you commit to marriage. Anybody hear me up in here? What you're saying, Pastor, y'all, there's a lot of people out there who not getting married. All right? Now, they want all the benefits of marriage, but they don't want to get married. All right? And when we, when we try to derive all the benefits of marriage and not get married, we leaving our kids a legacy. But it's a legacy of shacking up. It's a legacy of fornication. And let me tell you, we could, we could preach till we blew in the face. But at the end of the day, they do, what we, they do what they see and not what they hear. Anybody hear me up in here, all right? So we got people, amen. You've been, you've been playing Shaq, not Shaquille O'Neal either. I'm talking about shacking up. You've been playing Shaq, amen, for years. May even be sitting in here right now. And you know that's not God's best for you. And you would never pick that for your children. But the fact of the matter is, amen, your legacy, listen, you're writing your legacy right now. And nine times out of ten, the exact way your parents did it, that's the way you're going to do it if God don't supernaturally intervene. Anybody hear me up in here? I'm talking about down to the T. If God don't move, hey, God, you're going to shack up as long as they shack up. Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going to happen. All right? We're living in a day, y'all, where marriage is in trouble. The marriage institution is in trouble. And they wonder why the country is in trouble. They wonder why our nation, the blacks, the Hebrews, they wonder why we in trouble, all right? What we need to understand is that the family is the bedrock, amen, of society. But what makes the family strong is the husband and the wife under that. That's, that's, woo, that's, that's, that's a foundation. Now, of course, Christ is the cornerstone, all right? But what I'm saying is, is that family is important. It's so important. It was the first institution that God made in the Garden of Eden. Anybody hear me up in that? God made marriage, amen, before he made government, before he even made church, amen. He made marriage, amen. Because God was saying if we can get this right, everything else is going to follow. The reason we're looking at the systemic failure of humanity is, is we need to go back to these basic relationships between husband and wife. And when we look at marriage, your marriage is in trouble. And it's in trouble because people are not getting married no more. They won't get married no more. I did a little research, and W. Bradford Wilcox says that marriage is actually in the worst place it's ever been in our generation. While we live in, y'all, it's in the worst place. The Pew Research says that the number, of Amer the number of Americans who are single, and catch this, and never been married, is at a historic high. The single and never been married. They got some 40, 45, 50. Never been married. All right? And don't want to get married. Still won't be a player. Boy, you too old for that. You understand what I mean? You know? I don't want to be tired down. Boy, your bad knees already tying you down. You know what I'm saying? You better get tired down. You know? Don't need somebody to take care of your old self in a second. All right, can I be real for a second? They're not getting married no more. It take a man to marry a woman. Take a man to marry a woman. That's not for boys. Boys don't marry. You understand what I'm saying? Now, this, this statistic is particularly troubling in the black community. All right? It's getting worse and worse, y'all. When we go back, amen, to maybe the 60s or something like that, that statistic of people being single and never being married, amen, has quadrupled. It's four times higher today. You know what I'm saying? We got 36% of us, y'all, single and never been married. Not even want married. And can I go deeper for you? Research shows that the millennials, you see, we Generation X, all right? Some people say, I ain't Generation X, Pastor. All right. All right, but, but, but I'm Generation X, but, but the millennials are the ones born from 82 to two, 2004. Research showed that the millennials, they're not showing too many signs of being even interested in getting married. And TP, you know that's your generation, huh, T? All right, that's, that's you? 
Yeah, yeah. Y'all know y'all friends. Look, a lot of them not married, and a bunch of them saying, I'm good. I'm good. Let's keep it real. All right? And they're getting older, but they're not having a desire to get married. The result of this, y'all, is going to be that the marriage rate is even going to get lower. It's going to get to the lowest level it's ever been. All right? Now, we seeing marriage go down, but the people, are, the number of people, what we call in the legal realm, cohabiting, cohabitation, shacking up, that's going up, all right? Births to unmarried mamas going up. The hospital's getting more and more people, amen, having babies, but they're not married. Right now, nationally, it's 41%. But let me blow your mind for a second. If you think that's bad nationally with all of the races, when we get into the Hebrew communities, the black communities, let me tell you the statistic for that. Out of, out of 100 people that go to the hospital from blacks, 72% of them are from unmarried women. Seven, over 7 out of 10. And I told you before that when I, when I go to the hospital, we done had three kids already. They should know me by now. You understand what I'm saying? But when we go to the hospital, no, we're not having no more. That's it. But, but, but when we go to the hospital... Amen. They look at me funny. Like I'm her brother or something. I'm her husband. They, want, they don't want to show me none of the paperwork. They don't want to, they want, they don't, you know what I'm saying? I'm her husband. You know? But it's such a rare, a rarity that a black man going to be in a hospital with his wife having his child signing their birth certificate and putting his last name on that. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? And we need more of that. We need to rise up. It's the reason why we messed up, y'all. Because we ain't got that strong family unit no more. Where the men at up in here, huh? It's a boy that want to play forever. It's a man that marries. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me show you something in the scripture, all right? We need to leave a legacy of marriage. You got to marry that woman. You got five kids with that woman. You've been living with that woman for 12 years. Talking about you waiting and see. You done seen everything. <laughs> what in the world else you trying to see? Marry the woman. I ain't got no money. Money don't stop marriage. Man, listen, man. Listen, I tie one of them bread wraps, them bread wraps on each of y'all finger, bring y'all in the office this morning. You understand what I'm saying? Get it right, man. All right? Proverbs 18, 22, we got to keep moving. Y'all holding me up now. Y'all holding me up. Proverbs 18, 22. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth what? A good thing. That's right. That's right. All right. I want you to look at that sweetie pie next to you. And tell her. Tell her, baby, you a good thing. That's what now. Nah, come on now. Come on now. All right. But not only does he find a, a good thing, but he obtains, he gains, he, he gets credited to account. Favor from the Lord. Woo! I'm telling you here, this is where it's at, y'all. I looked up that word favor, it means approval from the Lord. Uh, 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 when you're liking someone or liking something that they do, so, so God approves marriage. He, he approved young men. He likes when you marry that woman. But not only that, it's not only approval and liking, but it's support. And God is saying, I'm not only going to prove you marrying that woman, I'm not only going to like you and, and, and like what you're doing, but I'm going to support you and support what you're doing. I, woo! Favor not only means approval, support, and liking, but it means to give someone something that they want. Hallelujah. How many people want favor this morning? Amen. Because with favor... Hallelujah, uh, 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 favor opens doors, huh? It ain't fair, but it's fabulous. And, 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 yeah, I say fabulous. And when, and, when, and when you walk in, favor will get things for you. Huh? That's what favor is. 
It'll get there. He's open doors for you. All right? God is saying, young man, that when you marry that woman, instead of fornicating, shacking up, doing what you got to do, God's saying that you're going to have favor with me. Hey, God, it's not just going to open doors for you at the theater or, or at this or at that. No, you're going to have favor with me. Every door going to open. Every, I'm, it's favor with God. It's, it's favor with God. Uh, favor also means an act of kindness beyond what is due or usual. And this simply means that when you marry, God will give you favor. And what that means is he will give you things and bless you in ways that you do not deserve. Amen. You, you shouldn't have it. You, you shouldn't be where you are. You shouldn't have got that job. You shouldn't have got that promotion. You shouldn't have had no children. You, That's what favor is. You know what I'm saying? Give you something you don't deserve. Now, now let, me, let me break it down for you in reality here. This is actually happening. And when I do weddings, I tell people, that I say, listen, listen, this is not just a scripture, no, but when you, when you look at the lives of married folk, amen, all together, and you look at the, the totality of their lives, how much they make and where they live at, hey, God, this scripture, hey, God, comes to manifestation. God didn't lie when he said it. You will see when you look at a couple that's married and striving to do the right thing, you are God, you, you're, not, you're just not going to hear about it from preaching, you are going to see the manifestation of that favor upon them. Woo! What you mean, Pastor? Listen, researchers have linked marriage to better outcomes with children, meaning married folk, hallelujah, get better product from their children. Married folk are involved in less crime. There's an increase in longevity. What that means? Married folk live longer. Hey, God. And have happier lives among many factors this dude j z uh j zakarski he says he's revealed that marriage is associated with even having more wealth married folk make more money than single or divorced folk amen or shacking up folk it's just the way it is and what's happening well god's scripture is coming into being well, you tell me, you say, Pastor, of course they're going to make more. Two is better than one. No, I'm saying that the married man and a, mar and a single man, the same education as him, the same age group as him, the same gifts and talents as him, that married man is going to make more individually by himself than that single man who's in the same position as him. Now, I went to, to the earthly psychologists, the worldly, hallelujah, uh, magazines, and Brian, look what they say. They say, we really can't explain why. We can't explain the numbers. We don't know why. We're just some reason. Is, is it that married men work hard on the job? Is it, that, is, it that, is it that more opportunities come? They just couldn't explain it. All right? All right? Let me give you some slides up here. Come on, come on, come on. Look at it here. This is, this is a graph. Some of y'all need charts. Y'all got to see it on the chart. Amen? This is a happy scale. All right? This is a happy scale, Brother John. Single, 20%. Cohabiting, 21%. Married, 43%. Say that they're happy. All right? Give me another slide here. Come on, come on. Here. Look, marriage and wealth. Married, company, married couples build more wealth on an average than single and cohabitating couples. Married men earn more money than single men in similar education and job. I was in line with y'all. Married women are economically better off. Then, hallelujah, people that's hallelujah, not married or, 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 or just want to just wanna quickly get out of marriage. Do I have another slide, prophet? I think I got another one for you. All right? Look at this. Even the children enjoy better physical health. Yeah. It reduces the risk of the two adults that's married and their children being, hallelujah, involved in violent criminal activity. Just by you getting married, all these things, it's like protection on you, protection on your family. It's like favoring your finances. It's like bigger houses. It's like, I got another grant. It's your most savings. How can this all be? I can tell you how it be. I can tell you how it all is. Because God don't lie, friends. You understand what I'm saying? He don't lie. He always tells the truth. Listen, you got to pass on a legacy of marital commitment. You tell them, listen, don't be just messing with the God. Don't just be doing that. Don't just be shacking up. Marry the God. You want to be, I said, God, marry the girl. You want to be blessed. 
Amen. And marriage is the way to obtain favor. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, listen, I have in my notes now, do your due diligence now. I'm not saying marry anybody. It's fine to mind you marry. Do your due diligence, all right? Don't come blame me. Just, you know. All right. B, what else do we have to pass on as a legacy? Well, that man is passing on to his son. Listen, I marry the woman I love. I, I married her. You should do the same thing. Hallelujah. But we also should pass on marital fidelity. Marital fidelity. And what I'm talking about here is faithfulness. All right? Faithfulness. We must have a legacy that we pass on to our children, being faithful to our spouse. All right? Now, because of the devil in the world that we live in, amen, and the temptation that's out there. All right? Let's just be real up in here. A lot of people, even in this room, a lot of people listening on the radio or, or even, amen, viewing on TV, amen, how you've already failed at this, and I understand that. I'm not here to condemn you, all right? But what I am here to do is encourage you, all right? It don't mean because you failed once that you got to continue to fail, amen? You, could, you, could, you, you know better so you could do better now, and you can still pass on a legacy of faithfulness, amen, amen, because you know the pain that unfaithfulness can cause. And in some ways, you can be a better teacher Woo! because you done been through that. You done walked down that road, and you know it's a dead end. So I'm not here to condemn you, no, but I'm here to challenge you from that, that from this moment on, hey, God, we raise up in this church. We raise up in our nation, amen? Marriage is that strong, and strong because we're faithful to one another. You understand what I'm saying? Anybody hear me up in here? All right. All right, we got to show them, y'all. You can't just tell them, thou shalt not commit adultery. You got to live it, man. You got to live it, man. You got to live it. 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Look what it says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. What did God do to, to, to help us avoid sexual morality? Well, he gave us marriage. And he told us, let every man have his own wife. And every woman have her own husband. You know what that means? No sharing. All right? They got this new thing going on in, in, in Hollywood and everywhere else. They want to talk about open relationships. I want to tell you what those open relationships open up. They open up a hot spot in hell. That's what they open up. Anybody hear me up in here? That's not God's best. That's not God's best. That caused a lot of trouble. It caused divorce. It caused a bunch of diseases. It caused, amen, uh, single parents. Amen. It causes poverty. That's not God's best for us, y'all. And I want to challenge you, be faithful. I'm not saying it's easy, because the devil out there, he's going to make it hard. But greater is he who's within us than he that works within the world. And with God, all things are possible. We can do it, y'all. We can look back, amen, hallelujah, be old and say, man, I done gave it my best, and I done been faithful these 20, these 30, these 40 years. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to say. I never forget, amen, they, they had just put me up uh, teaching, amen, in Baton Rouge. I, I got saved and I, I was teaching and, and an old deacon came up to me, gray hair. Amen, everybody was talking about all kind of stuff. And he looked me in my eyes and he said, young man, I've been faithful to my wife 50 years. And I ain't never forgot that. I ain't never forgot that. I ain't never forgot that. And when he told me that, knowing where I was from, knowing my past, knowing everything, I looked at that man and I said, I said to myself, I said, God, I want that testimony. I want that testimony, God. I got to have it, Mark. I got to have it. You know what I'm saying? And we got to be intentional about it. But pastor, I done, I, done, I done messed up already. Listen, begin again. All right, begin again. Amen. And do this thing and do it right. Amen? But you got to be intentional about it. All right? You, you, uh, marriage is a monogamous relationship. The polygamy days are over. You have one over here, one over there. Nah, that's not teaching your kids good things. What you need to know is that 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 tell us about people who live habitual lives like that. You know? And I'm not talking about the person that had it rough, you made one mistake, but if you habitually living in adultery, listen, God got a place for that. And I'm going to put that in the NLT. Come on now, you know how we do that feeling. I'm going to keep it real. I preach the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. And he tell us in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, I put it in the NLT so you can hear it. 
Don't you realize that those who do wrong, and in the Greek is the present tense, who habitually do wrong. It's not a, it's not a, a, a saint that fall down in bad times like David, amen, and never do it again. That's not what he's talking about. But in your heart, amen, you wake up and you want to live like that. He said, all right, you, you won't habitually do wrong? Guess what? You will not inherit what? The kingdom of God. Don't fool yourselves, he's saying. Don't fool yourself, because that's the only one you're fooling. Those who indulge in sexual sin. Hear me, young people, hear me. Who worship idols. Who commit and live lifestyles of adultery, riding through the neighborhood, looking what you can get into when you know you got a wife at home or a husband at home. He said, you're living like that. He said, male prostitutes. He said, those who practice homosexuality. I don't care what the media say. I don't care what TV say. They're not the judge, y'all. On that judgment day, the Bible said a book's going to be open. It ain't a book of 2017. It's the book of the word of Almighty God that don't change. Anybody hear me? He's not going to judge us by the standards of these days. He ain't going to bend the rules like that. Only way you get a bent rule is through the blood of Jesus Christ and through the cross of Calvary. That's the only way you get a ticket. Huh? Listen to me. Good. He said those that's doing that, listen, no habitual thieves, no habitual greedy folk, no habitual drunkards, no the abusive, no those that extort or cheat people. None of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. None of them. You see, because when you get saved and it's God's seed that's living in you, though you might make a mistake, that seed in you going to convict you so bad, woo, you ain't going to touch that ever again in your life. Oh, God, it's like putting your hand on a hot stove. Oh, Daddy, I ain't going to ever do it again. You see? But when we see people who habitually mean they don't have that seed just yet. They don't have that, that convicting Holy Ghost just yet. But by the end of the service, you're going to be able to get that. And you're going to begin to start the vacation process where God going to make you the man and make you the woman that he intended you to be. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <laughs> yes, our children got to see us faithful, y'all. They got to see us faithful. And we got to do our best. Why? Because we don't want them to live lives, amen, where they're in a marriage where nothing but infidelity is going on. You know how much pain that caused you. If you love them, you got to do something about it. Right. And you start with, listen, when you look at me, you will not see me doing this. Huh? And not because your eyes not on me. No, you're not going to see me because I'm not doing it. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. All right. Listen, God wanted me to tell you a word before I leave this point. All right. You know, how sometimes I'm in my prayer class. I say, God, what do you want me to tell them? All right. What do you want me to tell them? What, what do you want to say that will burn something in their mind? All right? And in their heart. This is what I heard the Spirit say to me. God wanted me to tell y'all that some of you are not leaving a legacy of faithfulness. And you could be not leaving a legacy of faithfulness and being faithful to your husband. You could be faithful to your husband and not leaving a legacy of faithfulness. Let me show you how. You're raising your kids to be adulterers. You're raising your kids to be adulterers. You're letting them talk to, date, go out with all kind of little boys and little girls. You, 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 you let them go here, you let them go there. It's one boy this week, it's another boy the next week, it's, it's another girl next month, amen. And you, you foster in that environment. How can we be saved and love God and us not walk in sexual sin? But we let them do it. When the Bible say train them up in the way they supposed to go. You hear me up in here? That's conviction I feel in the air. Because a lot of us done did it wrong. I'm not condemning you. I'm not condemning you. I'm not condemning you. Amen. Well, pastor, I can't go back, but you got grandchildren you can speak life, life into. Anybody hear me? How we raising adulterers, pastor? Well, you're letting them switch partners. You're letting them go from pillar to post. All through high school, all through college, and then somehow when that magical fella comes, amen, he going to marry her, and now she's just going to stop what she's be doing, been doing all her life? No. No, she's going to keep switching seats. Because that's what you're better to do. That's what you're better to do. 
Listen to me good, man. We got to slow down all that boyfriend, girlfriend stuff. Anybody hear me up in here? Got to slow all that down. Put the brakes on that. All right? Because you're raising them to switch partners. All right? You tell your little girls and your little boys, listen to me. I'm holding you for your spouse. And hold yourself for your spouse. I tell my little girls all the time, be faithful to your husband now. Be faithful to him now. You hear me, Jenna? Now. And Lee's looking at me, Dad, I'm only eight. So what? Be faithful now. Though you don't know him, God knows him. And you're not married now, but one day you will be. You are holding that treasure, that blessing for him now. We talking all kind of bored and all that. Nah, man. Nah. I'm releasing her, both of them, to a husband. Not a boyfriend. And I'm releasing Omar to a wife. Not a boo. Not a baby daddy. And I can't control everything, but I'm going to try with all of me. I'm just talking about being intentional. Some of us not even being intentional. Yeah, sure, we can try and fail, but at least we tried. Some not trying. Some not trying. Y'all with me? Y'all all right up in here? We got to get back to it, y'all. Mm -hmm. We got to pass down a legacy of nonviolent conflict resolution. <sighs> Come on, take a deep breath right now. Take a deep breath. <sighs> let it out, let it out. Inhale, exhale. Oof. Of non conflict resolution. You see? Non violent conflict resolution. That's the legacy that we have to pass on. What does that mean, Pastor? We cannot pass down a physically abusive marriage to our children. Can't pass that down. Those days are over. You in church now, and you're real, you're in real church. You're saved now. You was putting your hands on people when you wasn't saved. If you're saved now, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All that become new. When we say we don't do things like, we, like when we was lost, man. When we was lost, we did that. You know, and I don't blame you because, listen, if we would go back, that's all you knew anyway. That's all you saw. But I want you to remember how you felt when you was young, when they was getting down right in front of you. I want you to remember that and have some empathy. Because you're putting your children through the same thing that hurt you the most. I don't know how you could do that. It's got to be a time in your life, in your Christianity, where you tell yourself these hands are not for hitting the people I love, man. They not for that, man. Now, if somebody come mess with them, you know what I'm saying? But not to hit them, man. And in this Louisiana culture, huh? Huh? Sister Kathy, hallelujah. Brother, I don't know your name. Tell me your name. Alexander. Brother Alexander. Yes, Brother, you tall, bro. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Yes, Come on. And y'all might not be familiar with the Louisiana culture, but in this area, it's a bunch of bon ton roulé. That means a bunch of partying, a bunch of drinking, you know? And so it's a bunch of domestic violence. It's a stronghold here, man. Louisiana rank in one of the highest in the country, man. Y'all don't have to tell me. You don't have to come up here and act like you ain't putting your hands on somebody. The statistics speak it. The statistics say one out of every four women got abused in their lifetime by a significant other. One out of four. That's like if I had to stand up four women at this altar, at least one of them then got hit by a loved one, by, by a husband, you know? And for me, that's too many, y'all, all right? We got to leave a legacy of non-violent conflict resolution. The reason is, and I'm just going to flow for a second. When they watch you hit their mama, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that's a little boy, whether he want to or not, he going to have a tendency, a predisposition to hit his wife. Huh? And that wife he hitting on is somebody's daughter. Mm. I pray for my children, man. 
and you should pray for yours. Because I'm wondering, I'm like, God, we trying to do all this. We striving, we struggling. I ain't putting my hands on nobody. God, God, please, God bless her husband right now. Lord, don't let him be seeing nothing like that, Daddy. Please, Lord. Let it come from somebody in this church. Daddy, please, Daddy. Somebody say, I give her, I give her, I give her, I give, I give my son to you, daughter. Not yet, not yet. You see? There's a propensity to repeat. Now that's a son. Now check this, Curtis. A daughter that see that, she ain't gonna feel love till she get hit. She ain't gonna feel love till she get hit. She ain't gonna want a man that's not gonna hit her. That's what you want your children to operate in? Man, y'all, please, y'all, please. Your pastor is begging you. Stop fighting one another. Amen. Man of God. <laughs> man of God, you are putting your hands on the daughter of a king, man. Yeah. And, and, and I got to keep it real. Because they got some tough southern women up in here. And I just won't keep it real. Because my mama was tough as well. I done seen her flip people in the dish before. Mom, stand up so everybody can see. Listen. All right, all right. All right. Listen. Because sometimes it ain't a man that's doing the hitting. It ain't a man that's doing the hitting. TP, you shaking your head up. And, oh, 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 all right, all right. Sister-in-law. All right, all right, all right. Sometimes. Now, woman of God, let me challenge you now. Let me challenge you. Don't put your hands on that man, no. Don't put your hands on that man. Don't put your hands on that man. Think about your son. You don't want no woman beating up on your son. Look at you. Oh, yeah, let her try. <laughs> let her try. Come on, gangster, settle down. Nonviolent. Conflict resolution. What does that mean, Sierra? I'm not talking about you, Sierra, but I'm saying, what does that mean? We can resolve it, Cousin Mike. We can resolve it without using our hands. Amen. We can resolve it. There's nothing we can't resolve without using our hands. I mean, come on, man. Come on. All right? We can resolve it. All right. Look, I got to move on. All right. But let me give you a, a couple of statistics and then a couple of scriptures on that. And then we're going to move on. Now, now we, it's bad in every other culture group. But guess where it's worse at? In black, black America. Huh? Black women are 35 percent higher. A higher rate than white women to suffer domestic violence. They got some getting hit in here, in this service, in domestic violence. And I'm not judging you, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. They don't talk about it enough, y'all. They don't talk about it enough. Huh? Huh? They don't talk about it enough. You know? Especially in church. They're going to kick Cullen Kaepernick out of the league, but they ain't going to kick a bunch of them out of the league. Amen? That's another score. Look, 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 look. Let me tell you this, let me tell you this. In Afghanistan and Iraq, that war, 6,488 troops got killed. And the numbers could be a little more, a little less, because we're still getting some casualties over that to this day. Right? In the same time frame of the Afghanistan and Iraq war, where 6,000 of them died, 11,766 women were murdered because of domestic violence. And if we have Iraq and Iran on the news all the time, and when a troop get killed, it's put up there. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not taking no respect from our troops. But what I'm saying is we got a war going on at home as well. And <laughs> y'all don't put your hands on each other, man. I had a friend lost his mama like that. The hands of his daddy. 
The Bible say in the book of Ephesians, it say, be angry and sin not. Because I'm not asking you not to get angry, especially not in marriage. We will get angry in marriage. But what I'm saying is, is that you should have the self-control to get angry and sin not. Sin not. Go out, get your punching bag, man. Huh? Get your video game, play some punch out or something. Do, do something. But sin not. You see? Look what I have here. Look what I have here. Ten million kids are exposed to domestic violence every year. They see it. Hmm? And when they get exposed to it, the cyclical process begins in their life. What I'm asking you for this morning is that you would be big enough throughout all your generations going back to your people who was on the plantation that you would be the man or the woman that would be big enough to stand up and say, enough. Amen. Enough. It's over. It's not going to pass me. Let me show you the cycle of abuse and then we're going to on, move on. I'm going to just show you the cycle of abuse. And this is to help some of our ladies that are men that might be in abusive relationships. It sounds funny to say men, yeah, but I'm telling you. Them girls from Truman Tough. <laughs> That's a neighborhood, a rough neighborhood in Lafayette. Them girls from Truman Tough, man. All right? Them country girls. Cycle of abuse. All right? It start off with tension. The spouse being critical, aggravated, right? Then the incident comes, it's a blow up, bomb, it's a crisis. Where it's either verbal, we're going to get to it in a second, or it's physical. Then you have the reconciliation. That's the quasi-honeymoon period because after they put their hands on you, they're going to make it better than ever. They're going to they cook for you, clean for you, buy your gifts. You're going to get that Brazilian hat you wanted. You're going to, hey, hey, I mean, listen, it's going to be on. You're going to say to yourself, man, listen, I hope he hit me next week because uh, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. God forgive me. But listen here, listen, that reconciliation period. And what it is is a brainwashing. Because they reconcile so good, the next stage is calm, tranquility, a placid lake. And the, between the honeymoon, the reconciliation, and the calm, the victim actually forgets that they ever was abused. Are you in a cycle of abuse? Pastor, what do I do? You got to get you some counseling, baby. You got to get you some counseling, baby. You got, to, you got to talk to somebody that you trust, amen. It could be me. If I'm out there running, it could be first lady, amen. It could be the ministers, amen. And, and we under an obligation, amen, of confidentiality. We're not telling your business. But a lot of people won't leave that predicament because of embarrassment. Because they look so good on Sundays and they don't want people to know. When can we get real, huh? When can we get real? By the time we come out and tell somebody, the woman of God going to look at you and say, I, was, I, was, I went through it too. And a lot of people don't leave because of economic dependence. He make too much money. Baby, where you fade at? My God owns the cat on a thousand hills. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. You see? Some don't leave because, of, because they feel it would be sin when they're in a real bad abusive relationship. And as your pastor, let me tell you something. You study the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And it talks about, amen, how God give us the right to separate. I'm not telling you to divorce him just yet. I'm not telling you nothing like that. But what I am telling you, don't you stay in a life-threatening situation because you don't properly interpret the scriptures. Don't, don't stay in that situation. Oh, no, no, no. Get out and let that brother catch his head. I guarantee when his honey gone, he going to realize, hey, I ain't, I ain't, <laughs> he going to wear mittens around the house.
All right, I think y'all got enough of that, yo. Come on, give God some glory, amen? All right, here's the next one. We're almost done. Non-abusive verbal conflict resolution. Pastor, you put a nine. Legal terms, court terms. I got I got We got to talk about this, man. Because it's not only bad when you put your hands on somebody. Sometimes when you put your mouth on somebody, it's worse. See, because bruises heal you. Yeah. But some of them words that we speak on one another as husbands and wives, sometimes they don't go away. We need to strive, y'all, not only to refrain from putting our hands on one another, but not put our mouth on one another. Because our kids listening, and the way we talk to each other, two things going to happen. <laughs> Your son, watch you, man of God, talk to that wife, his mama like that. Number one, that's disrespectful, dishonoring. If you don't honor her, why are you expecting him to honor her? But why you don't honor your mom? Why you don't respect your mom? You don't. Man, that's a, that's a queen, man. That's a princess, man. I don't talk to her that way. And if I ever catch you talking to her that way, boy, I ain't always been saved, no boy. Listen. Shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Listen to me now. You got to respect her. And woman of God, you got to respect him. Pastor, what that's talking about? Come on, man. Listen. Abusive language. Like that cursing, calling each other out their name. Why are you going to say that to the woman you married, man? What does that say about you when you call her that? <laughs> you insulting yourself. What man ever hated his own flesh? What... You might as well look at yourself in the mirror and call yourself that. What is wrong with you, man? You saved, but you're not yet delivered. And you got to get some deliverance this morning. You're that cursing spirit, that calling. Man, listen, man. Li no, no. No. That's low, man. That's low living. Where God want to take you. You can't bring that with you up to that. It, it's, it's more refined where we're going. It's more honorable where we're going. You, you, you can't take that mouth up there. You can't take that up there. You can't even be sitting with the people that we're going to be sitting with in one of these expletives. Expletives come out your mouth. That, you can't do that, man. That's not professional. It's not respectful. It's just, there's no honor in that, no chivalry in that. Man, listen, man. That's bottom dwellers talk like that, man. Come up with me, man. Unsaved, uneducated, poverty stricken. People who can't articulate what they mean in, in, in a proper vocabulary use curse words. <laughs> you can convey everything you mean without using them words, man. But it's not only curse words. Insults. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Bringing up her past and, and, and not like, like you don't have a past too. <laughs> like, 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 like the word center on your forehead is somehow smaller than center on her forehead. You know? She a center, you a center too. But we begin to insult and belittle. Now, woman of God, you got a gift in that area. You tell that man he ain't worth nothing, ain't doing nothing, can't put the trash to the street out of right. Look at that trash can crooked over there. <laughs> if I want to do something, I've got to do it myself. You can't do nothing. You don't cut the grass right. You, everybody making more money than you. Then you start comparing. You start comparing. Look at you, look at you. Boy, pastor doing this, pastor doing that. That boy been saved six months. Yeah. 
That boy just getting out of high school, you understand? I done been to college two, three times. You understand? You want to make a comparison now. Got that man feeling low and got that man mad at me and I ain't done him nothing. <laughs> Looking at me like, mm, he think he's, ah, what, what's going on? That's, man, listen. <laughs> Y'all better check that at home, man. Don't be comparing your man to people, no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. You make him feel small. And you make him, amen, want to, hallelujah, uh, 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 make enemies with people that can actually help him. That can actually help him. He don't like brothers in here that's moving some things because you don't compare him. Why you don't dress like G-Money? What's with your G-Money, 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 G-Money? What you think he going to say when he see G-Money? Hmm. I like to cut up, y'all. I like to cut up here. Cursing, insults. You know what I'm saying? You got to watch that, man. That's abusive language. Listen, I love what George Washington say, man. He say all that cursing stuff. He say, and I ain't going to read it all because we got to move. But he say, it's really for the wicked and, and it's for fools. You know, that's what profanity and, and, and derogatory language is for the wicked and it's for fools. And, and I'm going to tell you, man, they sow that into our communities. Our music is, is laced with that, is laden with that. And what you hear and what you see, you're going to operate in. Amen. That's why we need a new song. We need a new music. We need a new movement. We need, a, we need something that, that the people are going to embrace. Amen. Something good. Something blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. And when they get into it, hallelujah, they're going to begin. To, God going to renew all of that. You know what I'm saying? Theodore Roosevelt, he says, listen, we got enough words, y'all. We don't need to talk like that. That's the language of fools, man. That's the language of fools, he's saying. You see? Ephesians 4.29. How many people want some Bible in this? Let me give you some Bible. Come on. Let me give you some Bible. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Look what the NLT say. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. I'm, I'm, I'm praying, man. I am praying from my heart, man. I'm praying, you know, that, um, that, that we could just learn how to, how to talk to one another in our relationships. You know, when, when, they, when they see us honor each other, it's going to be easy for them to honor her. And, and as, they, as they watch her honor me and respect me, you know, they're going to honor and respect me. They're not going to talk to me crazy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and when they get married, they're going to talk to their husbands in a particular way. Come on, give God some glory. Amen? All right. I, I, I can't leave this point just yet, y'all. Um, here it is. All right? Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Matthew 12, 36. All right? But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Meaning that what we say out of our mouths, God going to judge us for it. Amen. And so we got we to gotta do that. Um, another thing we got to focus on when we talk about abusive relationship, uh, that when we argue, because we will argue as married folk. I'm not coming up here trying to be fake and act like me and First Lady. We don't have our differences of opinion. Amen. We do, and sometimes we talk about it, and we do talk about it. You understand what I'm saying? But uh, what we have tried to do, amen, is uh, in addition to no cursing and, 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 and trying our best to keep our decibels, our volume down. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, she'll tell, hey, hey, don't get loud on me. You know what I'm saying? I tell her, don't, hey, don't you get loud with me now. You getting loud. I ain't loud. You loud. I ain't loud. Must be hearing something else. I ain't never been loud. I was born quiet. <laughs> the other thing is, is that we try to never argue in front of the kids. All right, we try to never argue. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and, and if, if we got something deep to talk about, we don't talk about deep stuff in front of the children. Parents talk about, you'd be surprised when parents talk about deep stuff. They opening the accounts in front of the children, got the, all the bills, the money, you don't make enough. 
Them children ain't supposed to be worried about that. You talking about the way you're going to discipline the children in front of the children? Go in the room and talk about that. The children looking, one said, I want to whip them. The other said, don't whip them. You know, what is that going to do? So a divide happens. Yeah, don't whip me. Go in the room and talk about that. That's just wisdom, and I know some of y'all know that already, but I got to say it, y'all. Right? Don't talk about the in-laws in front of them cheering. That's their child grandma. Oh, I'm going to have to check myself. Ooh, I just got convicted. I, I, I think I said something about you, mama. I ain't going to lie. But you can't talk about it. You can't. You see? So, so we talk about the in-laws in front, then it could start to an argument. Well, what about what your mama doing? You're... Go in the room, man. Go in the room, man. All right? All right? Why? Well, look, look, statistics show that arguing in front of your kids threatens their emotional stability. Psychologically, it messes them up by you fussing in front of them. Because when you fuss in front of them, some things go on on the inside of them. Studies show that they could pick up on that at six months old. They put a little blood pressure monitor on them. They fuss in, and the, the, the infant blood pressure go up. As I kept studying, I found a study that said not six months, three months. And you know, my wife in that field, she said not even six months, not three months. While they in the womb. They could feel what mama going through and fuck. They, man, them children, man, they already, they come out emotionally messed up. Because you putting your hands and you're fussing with mama. Man, come on, man. I'm not going to fuss with you, man. I'm not going to fuss with you in front of the children. And, and it can be tempting because some things y'all need to talk about. Listen, we're going to talk about it now. Huh? Y'all ain't y'all doing, Brian? Come on, Brian. Don't you look at me like I, I'm the only one that said that. But even though we want to talk about it now, now is not the right time. We're going to drop the children home, Tyler. We're going to put them to bed. I can see Janice climbing and tucking you into bed. <laughs> Pastor, my friends here, don't make me not look cool, Pastor. You're cool. You're cool. Listen, put them to bed. And y'all go in the room and y'all talk. Don't put them babies through that. It, it disturbs them emotionally. The spirit telling me, go ahead and go. I, 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 I'm going to keep going. Look, let me tell you the, the emotional instability. Depression come upon your children as they hear you argue. Depression. Great sadness comes upon them. Is it over? Are they going to leave each other? Is it my fault? Can I do something to fix it? Them babies don't deserve that, man. Anxiety. Hmm? They're catching nervous breakdowns, man. What, what, what is you stressed out for? You're six. You don't have no bills. You don't have no call. You ain't in no relationship. I know, but I got enough drama between mama and daddy. Anxiety. We fussing. Why you can't stay still in school? And why you ADHD? Are you all in? Why? Why? What, what is going wrong? What is wrong with you? If them children could talk and enunciate, they would look you dead in the eyes and they say, you was wrong. You was wrong. All that fussing and fighting you're doing. You're passing me on a bad legacy, man. Look how y'all got me acting in here. We got guests up in here. What's wrong? They text me, man. I'm telling you, they say, Kathy Barrera. I say, Lord, why didn't preach a good sermon? All right, 
listen, we got to, we got to move on, man. We got to move on. Look, 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 I'm going I'm, to I'm, I'm spew these out right quick. Conflict resolution without fussing, without, without getting, look, stay calm, man. When y'all get into it, stay calm. Self-control, all right? Stay present, meaning don't flip out and go in the past. You remember when you did? Listen, we're talking about the cornbread that's in the oven right now. What in the world are you bringing up 1976 for? Stay present, man. That's how stuff go really bad. You see what I'm saying? Those old grudges, those old wounds. Stay calm, stay present. You know what I'm saying? What else you got for us, Pastor? Listen, be respectful. Be respectful. Talk to her like that's your wife. And talk to him like that's your husband. And talk to them like they're children of God. Be willing to forgive. You know? Be willing to forgive. Know when to let it go. All right? We can't talk about it forever. Can a man say amen? amen. Can't talk about it forever, baby. We done done that. We, we got it. We got it. I heard you. I understand. You know? Pick your battles. Right? But last night when that pipe burst in my attic, I was so ag last night. Ooh, I was aggravated. My little wife was doing the best she could to help me, too. Holding the flash. I was aggravated about everything, though, Jen. I was like, Lord, she holding the flash like two inches off. Two inches off. Why can't she... Why doesn't she have a tea wrench to turn our water off? Doesn't she know to bring her tools with her when we working? Her hands, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking all this. I never said it. I never said it. Thank you. <laughs> you hear me, Brother Tony? Her hands are on the wrong place holding my ladder. I'm safer. This is my safe place. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> but all of those things really wasn't even her. It was me. It was me. You know? And, and, and I'm just ag. You know what I'm saying? I'm just ag. Pastor, you get ag? Yeah, watch me. <laughs> and I, I'm, just, I'm just aggravated. I, I'm, I'm in the world. I'm where I want to be. And, and, and water driven out my attic. So I'm ag. And so little things wasn't lining up right, but I got to learn how to, how, to, how to overlook some things, how to pick my battles. So what, we going to fuss now? What, how how, how that's going to stop the water? <laughs> oh, God. Love, I love you, love. I, I ain't never told you all this. We, we talking about it now, but this is my therapy up here. I mean, that. I ain't say nothing, Sean. But she knew I was there. She was like, what's up, man? You going to break me up? <laughs> hey, hey. I, I understand that. I understand that. <laughs> hey, I mean, you know, you can't do it now, but one day you probably will. That's why I ain't messing with your mama like that, man. I love you, mama, man. <laughs> you know? yeah. We ain't got no problem, man. No, look. <laughs> now look. <laughs> Wait till we get home. <laughs> listen. All right, listen. Y'all got me sweating up in here. Listen. <laughs> That's funny, huh? We a normal family you're here. Is <laughs> there's no mystique about we just we pressing, man. We pressing, man. You know what I'm saying? We. Yeah, that's Sabrina Brennan. We, we pressing like everybody else, man. You know, and sometimes we're going to get it right, other times we're going to get it wrong, but we keep pressing, man. You know? You know? Hallelujah. So listen, let's move on for my boss say something again. Listen, <laughs> we got to leave a legacy of no divorce. And this is going to be our last one because it's, it's, it's time. We got to leave a legacy of no divorce. And, 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 and I know this is a tough situation because, listen,
Some of us done been through that already, all right? And, and, and remember what I'm saying. I'm not condemning you, amen, but we know better now. Let's do better now, amen, and, and let's make this this one that we're in right now. Let's make this one last. Let's make it take a go at it. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about. And for those that's still in it, amen, you're still in your first marriage, amen, let, let us go ahead and give it all we have, amen, and, and make sure we leave a legacy, amen, hallelujah, where, 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 where we don't have a single one, single divorce, amen, and if we've done it in the past, amen, let's start anew, he the God of a second chance, third chance, fourth chance, amen, and let's just do it right. And so we should strive to not leave a legacy of divorce. Why? Well, saints of God, divorce affects our children, right? Uh, children of divorced parents are more likely actually to get a divorce. Uh, daughters of divorced parents are 60% higher in, in the rate, amen, to go ahead and get a divorce. For men, is 35% is higher than a regular person, amen. Let me give you some other things, amen. Stay, we got to fight to stay in our marriages, amen. Uh, 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 divorced children are two times more likely to drop out of high school. 25% of them become disengaged with family. They don't even want to be bothered with family no more. Uh, they're more likely to have behavioral, academic, and psychological problems. Amen. And, uh, and it's just not a good place to put your children. Amen. Well, passed out and put them there already. Don't put them through it again. You understand what I'm saying? You know, let's focus on today. I'm not trying to bring you back to the past. I'm trying to get you on today and on tomorrow. Amen. We're forgetting those things that's behind us. We're pressing on into the future. And, and, and I'm telling you the word that you wish you would have had uh, back then. So, so listen, God work all things out for good. Amen. But you need this message. All right. Amen. And so, and so listen, man, children living in households with unrelated adults, amen, they, they, they die of inflicted injuries, uh, meaning that you'd be surprised, but, but when, you, when you break those families up and you put children and in, 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 in families that they don't belong without Christ and, and there's no church and no God, amen, uh, you get an increase, amen, a child abuse that's going on. When that original family would have stayed plugged up, hallelujah, that wouldn't be there. Amen. And I'm not trying to harm or hurt or speak down to our blended families. Amen. Because God can make all things new. Amen. God can do, God can do something. All right. Hallelujah. Listen to me good, man. We got to strive to keep the marriages together. I want to show you what God said in Malachi 2.16. I'm not trying to condemn nobody. Listen to me now. Listen to me. Give it to me in the NLT so we can make it quick. Bible say, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, putting her through a lot. The man going to go through a lot, says the Lord, heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. That's the Lord talking, man. That's not me. You know? Now listen to me, for those that's in marriage right now, you're in a rough patch. And you came, amen, and you was praying the Lord, give me you. I need you here. I need a word from you. You're going through trouble, you're thinking about divorce. Listen to me good. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it unless, hallelujah, you got biblical grounds. Don't leave unless, amen, some abuse going on and then you can separate. I, I understand those things. But if it's just about, as the courts say, irreconcilable differences, you better try your best to hang on in there, man. Because you should leave a legacy. A legacy, amen, of marriage. Now this scripture, for those who've already got divorced, don't be alarmed by this. Right? Don't think that on judgment day, somehow God going to bring your divorce back up. Nah. The Bible says, listen, though your sins be red as scarlet, the blood of Jesus will wash as white as snow. All right? And for some of you, it's not even your fault. It's not even your sin. You see? It's what somebody else done did you. So I don't want you to leave here feeling guilty or nothing like that. It's not, it's not that type of sermon. You see? It's a sermon that tells us, listen, the marriage we in right now, we're going to do our best, y'all, to keep it going. So that our children could get a legacy of it. So that they could stay faithful and stay married. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <laughs> listen, that's it, saints. Listen, I'm telling I had another point, but listen, I think we got something here. 
I think we got some. Right? I think we got some. And I want to pray right now. Right? Leaving a legacy of marriage. Right? If you're here and you're not saved and you don't know Christ, it's going to be hard for you to leave a legacy of marriage. Me and my wife tell each other all the time, if we didn't have the Lord, we strong personalities. Miss Tebow is strong. And I'm nice yet, but I like my weight. All right? When God put leaders together, we got great potential. Because it's like two strong horses. And we'll pull and we'll run if we do it right. Take this thing to the inner world. But if we're not right, the very thing that could bless us the most or hurt us the most. Without him. Without him. And when we was younger, we got together when we was younger. Money, remember that? Destiny, remember that? And without him, it didn't even work. So we broke up. You know? Went through all kind of bad stuff. Unsaved. The Lord began to draw me. I'm in my apartment, my roommate, hey amen, I'm going through. My roommate said, you didn't have all that problem when you was talking to Chantel. I said, let me call her. That was G-Money to me. I called her. I said, hey, what you doing, boo? <laughs> Nothing. Mind if I come by and pick you up? Miss Aola was at UL at that time, too. You know? Went by and pick her up. I got radically saved after that. The drawing was over. I got saved, saved. She got saved. And this turned to this. You see what I'm saying? I wonder who I'm talking to today. All you're hearing is this. You ain't surrendered yet, man of God. You ain't surrendered, woman of God. It starts with you today. What I have to do? You come and you admit that you're a sinner, like us all. You come and you believe that your Savior died for all your sins. You open your mouth and you confess him and you ask him, Lord, save me. I don't have it right, can't do it right. I'll break it if you give it to me. I need you, Daddy. Fix it for me. And the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What you're looking at this morning in Pastor and First Lady is nothing special. It's an everyday work of God. For God is not a respecter of persons. What he do for one, he'll do for all. It's about your surrender. It's about your surrender. That's all it's about this morning. How much of God are you willing, how, many, how much of you are you willing to give God? The second call is not going to be for people that need Jesus. It's going to be for you. That's Christian in here. Because I believe in my spirit it's surrender time. I believe we have some people in here that mm, you done tried it. You done gave it your best. But you had to end it yourself. And you need a little help from the sanctuary this morning. We suddenly here to pray with you. 
We're going to call for our singles that need to take that step for marriage. We're going to call our married folk that just need a little help from the Lord this morning. We're going to call for the, the lost, the unbeliever, the one who needs to find Christ this morning. Ushers, please, open the gates. My love, would you mind coming up with me for a second? Amen. And please don't pinch me because of last night. She said, I didn't know you was aggravated. <laughs> I tried to hide it as best I could. Come, let us pray for you. And while we pray for you, you pray for us. Come, let us pray. Come on. Come on. A lot of folk think the altar just for people who need salvation. The altar is for us all. Huh? My cousin Mike, who amongst us got it perfect? Huh? I know my cousin, me, I know my cousin. You know what I'm saying? We can be a handful sometimes. We want to leave a legacy, y'all. Better than what you was brought up in. I believe, Monroe, that if our generation just attempt intentionally to do it right, leaving legacy, what would that next generation go look like? <laughs> we will be able to do undo in one generation everything the devil tried to put on our backs to break us. We will arise as a people and shake it off all at once. In Jesus' name. Listen, we got to pray. We got to pray. We got y'all keeping me up in here. We got to pray. Say it with me. Say, Lord, my God. I need you. Can't do it without you. I'm not ashamed to say it. You are God and I am not. Thank you for loving me. I've sinned and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. These hands, this mouth, these eyes were not made for sin. They were made for you. <laughs> I'll bring them back to you now. <laughs> At the altar. I present my body to you. And I'm ready to do what I was born to do. I believe that you died on the cross for all of my sins. You were buried in the grave. And on the third day, you rose. Lord, save me, a sinner. Sanctify me. Clean me up. Fill me with your Holy Ghost. I need your help. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. I want you to see something breaking. I want you to see something breaking right now. Come on, imagine something breaking right now. Imagine something breaking right now. Imagine something breaking right now. It could be a chain. It could be a vase. It could be a glass. It could be a wheel. Hey, ask him. I want you to break the cycle. I've 
I've had enough. I need, you. I need you. And use me to leave a legacy from this day forward. I'm living for legacy. I'm not worried about yesterday. I'm living for legacy. Use me, Daddy. Use me, Daddy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God some glory. Come on, give him glory. We're going to walk out. Hallelujah. Miss Kathy, it's your, it's your first, first Sunday. Boy, I tell you, I'd have gave you the mic if, if you'd have been here before. But I didn't want to put no pressure, pressure on you. You probably could have handled it anyways. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. The fight is over. The violence is done. The verbal abuse, that's a past thing. We've been made new. 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 Deliverance on our mouth, deliverance on our hands. May he bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance upon you and bless you with shalom and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Love y'all saints. Be blessed. Love you, Beth. Love you too, Brother Mark. <laughs>